Good morning. Genesis 26, 7. We'll look at verse 6. And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. And the men of the place asked of his wife, and he said, She is my sister. For he feared to say, She is my wife. Least he, least he said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. Now, I'm going to talk about a subject today I know about, and I don't need a doctor of uh, theology, which I am a doctor of theology, and I apologize for my voice. But I'm talking about a subject today that I know well of, because it is personal in my life. It is personal in my family's life. And it's personal in all the families since Adam. Now Isaac says, honey, they're going to take you. They're going to kill me. Will you lie for me? Does this sound familiar? If you read your Bible, does that sound familiar? Let's run over to Genesis chapter 12. I love this new program here. I can do it for you. In, verse, in Genesis 12, verse 10 here, and there was famine in the land, and Abram, not Abraham yet, this is Abram, went down to Egypt to sojourn there, and for the famine was grievous in the land. Sound familiar? And it came to pass when he was come near to enter to Egypt that he said to Sarai, not Sarah, they haven't had their names changed yet, Sarai, his wife, Behold, now I know thou art fair woman to look upon. Sound familiar? And therefore it shall come to pass, verse 12, when the Egyptians shall see thee, they shall say, This is his wife, that we may kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister. Sound familiar? That it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Sound familiar? Honey, they're going to kill you because you're beautiful. Amen. I want you to lie for me. Okay? We're not done. Genesis 20. Now, in Genesis 12, Isaac's not even thought of yet, as far as in the womb. Isaac has not been conceived. You got Abram and Sarai. In Genesis 20, verse 12, Abraham, all right, now we got Abraham, now the promise of the child is to come, said to Sarah, She's got her name changed. Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. Isaac's not around. And we see in Genesis 12, Genesis 20, Abram, Abraham, honey, lie for me. Now, I don't know how in Genesis 26, that Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Sarah, is put in a circumstance, and he says to his beautiful bride, lie for me. Did you get it? Now, let me give you, and I'm sorry to say, I don't want to ruin my family name. Uh, uh, my mom is saved. She's going to heaven. Glory to God. I'm not sure about my dad. I believe my dad's in hell today. I'm sorry. I tried witnessing to him. My dad had a very bad, our family, alcohol problem. Very, very vicious memories I have of alcohol and my dad. I would remember 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, my mom getting an aluminum ladder, having to crawl through the bathroom door window hoping that my dad was asleep to, to bring her little boy back into his bed. And that little boy was me. Vicious. I grew up around drunks. I grew up around lobstermen and fishermen, drunks, and, and, and gambling, 
and womanizing and adultery. I grew up with that mess. I'm not trying to put a bad shadow. I'm trying to teach a message here. Wicked memories. And I'm sorry to say that my dad never apologized. But I'm looking at the sins of the parents that are upon the children. And I remember one time my dad had come home drunk. And we would have to leave. I remember one time my dad come home drunk and I, I thought I heard ice cubes being broken up. And I got up to get a drink and realized he was breaking the cable TV box. And so one time my mom and I were in the car, two or three o'clock in the morning. We're on Ocean Avenue. And my mom's talking to a little boy wrapped up in a blanket. She says, son, I don't remember the words completely. I hope what your father is doing will show you what not to do. And I, I say I forget the words, but the, the, the context of the, of the conversation between the mother and her son was, I hope you don't drink. And I remember telling my mom that night, at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, maybe just a little. And I remember a loving, caring mother taking her right hand and taking her hand and smacking me across the mouth. And I deserved it. I remember a time my dad was driving me to school and he smoked cigars. And the the, 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 the windows in the truck were, were rolled up, maybe it was winter or something. And I remember on Jefferson Avenue by the cemeteries, New London High School, I remember asking my dad, Dad, can you put that out, please? I remember my dad pulling the truck over and saying, if you don't like it, you can get out. He said, Stiley, why are you saying that? Because Stiley Hayward grew up to be a man. Stiley Hayward avoided the beer. Stiley Hayward carried in his life Bacardi. I don't forget if it was the rum, whatever, but alcohol. Who cares about beer? I grew up around beer. I grew up around the floor. I was into Bacardi. Everywhere I went, I brought my own bottle. I drank the hard stuff. And guess what else Stiley Hayward did? Stiley Hayward grew up and he went to school. He, he, the first day of, of high school, he's at the bus stop on Ocean Avenue of all places. We're at the bus stop and, and there's the seniors, there's the juniors, there's the sophomore. I was a freshman. Stiley Hayward walked up to the, uh, uh, the sophomore. And Stiley said, hey, give me one of them cigarettes. No peer pressure. I asked for my first cigarette. Why? Why Bacardi? Why cigarettes? Because my dad taught me it. Why did Stiley get into gambling? Why did Stiley do scratch-off tickets and all that? Because I've seen the lobstermen. I've seen the fishermen. I've seen my parents do it. My dad. My mom would buy scratch-off tickets and lottery tickets and play three and play four and lotto and all that. My parents showed me that. My parents taught me that. With a right hand to my mouth, don't do it. And Stiley Hayward grew up in alcohol and tobacco, womanizing, I'm sorry to say, and gambling. My parents didn't do drugs, but I did drugs. I was smoking marijuana and I was smoking crack. I was around prostitution. I didn't get, in, I was 
Was it in prostitution? But I, I was there. I, listen, I, I, I grew up with, with pimps. My first job, I remember, was for a pizza place. And I would, they were, they paid me to go out and, and pass out flyers. Simple enough. And I went out one afternoon passing out flyers. And I came back to the place and the cops were there. And the cop, he says, what are you doing here, son? I said, well, I got a job here. I'm passing. And the cop said, just go away. Just turn around, go out that door. Don't come back here again. I said, well, what's wrong, officer? He, I remember his words. They're, they're doing a lot more than oregano. I've been around that. I've been in the high rises of the ghetto of New London, Crystal Avenue. And if you know New London, you know what I'm talking about. And the other, I forget the names of the roads and uh, Michael Road and all that. I've been in those things. Don't you tell me. I have seen parents sitting there with a baby in their arms with a cigarette and the cigarette ash falling in the baby's face and watch that baby grow up and, and get cigarettes. Why? I have seen in my own family and I have seen in lives of other family children grow up. and Why are they doing that? Because you did it, my friend. I'm not going to get in great details, but with my son, I've seen a lot of reaping and sowing that i done in my life. And I don't like what I see in my son, but because what my son is doing is because what I've done. It's called, be not deceived, God's not mocked, whatsoever man soweth, that he shall also reap. That's the Bible. That's when your child grows up and does what you don't want them to do. Where they say you want the best of your child. And they grow up with your sins, which defiles the teaching of evolution. It don't get better. Mother, father. Mother, father to be. You are a teacher of that child, and that child will go of the nature of Adam to fall rather than get the goodness. My mom is saved. Glory to God. Thank you. And I have got terrible memories of what my dad did to my mom. My mom was a mistreated girlfriend, fiance, wife of my dad. My dad was an adulterer, fornicator, abusing alcohol. I saw that. I grew up in that. I cried for my mother at times. The things I saw that she had to put up with. I respected both my parents. I loved both my parents. My dad had a good job. My dad brought home money. My mom worked. My mom gave me extra amount of, of, of gifts and toys and wonderful like that. My dad paid the bills. Okay? But my dad taught me wrong. By his actions. My dad and my mom, every mom, every dad is a teacher of their children. All the wickedness that a little boy growing up, Stiley Hayward, saw the effects of alcohol. That little boy who grew up to be a man should never should have never got involved in that mess. And I thank God, my father in heaven, that when I married Lisa, we got in trouble by Lisa's family. 
He said, why did you get in trouble for leaving the family? Because by the time of, of November 2nd, 1991, God gave me the great victory. I poured all the alcohol out. I, we got rid of all the booze. I stopped all that nonsense. And when Lisa and I had our marriage and when we had our, 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 our wedding ceremony, we, our reception, it was a dry wedding. There was no alcohol at all at that wedding at that reception, and there had never been a drop of alcohol one day of my marriage with Lisa, and not even no alcohol in the day of my uh, of my marriage to Tracy. In 1991, I don't know what, what month it was, but in 1991, I, by the victory of God, put the alcohol away. My children never seen me take a drink. My dad was at my wedding reception with, with Lisa. You know what my dad did? My dad, at the other side of the reception hall that we were at, had multiple receptions. My dad had friends who also had a wedding reception, and he would go over to that wedding reception to get alcohol. You messed my childhood life up with alcohol. I am a born-again, saved Christian. I got rid of that crap. I got rid of the Satan's brew. I got rid of the, the, the serpent piss. And my dad, at the wedding reception, went over to a friend's wedding party to get booze. I had the victory in Jesus Christ. We didn't have booze. Glory to God in heaven. I got rid of that alcohol. The smoking. I smoked when, when Lisa and I were married. I smoked when we had our, our son, Henry. And we were at West Street Hospital, and at, at that point in time when Henry was born, I would have to go downstairs, go outside to smoke a cigarette. You couldn't smoke in the building. And grew up smoking. And in 1990, not in late 1990s, Lisa and I and Henry had gone somewhere. And we, were, we parked our car in the parking garage in New London. I can't remember the name of the road by the, by the, by the, train, by the railroad station. Well, that's well. I forget the name of the road, but the, the parking garage there. The Water Street parking garage. We were on the second, third level, and, you know, we're walking the car. We've done something that day. And the next thing you know, I passed out in the hood of the car. You see, you, you weren't drinking. What happened? I passed out. I couldn't breathe. And the long, short of the story is I ended up going to a pulmonary doctor. And we got a phone call one day. Lisa got a phone call. She handled all that for me. Thank God. Wonderful, great woman. And she called me on the phone. She worked first shift. I worked third shift. She called me on the phone. She said, Stiley, she says, the pulmonary doctor wants to talk to us now. I'm coming home. He wants to see us. And so the pulmonary doctor calls Lisa and I into his office. He says, I got the test results. He says, you got emphysema, COPD. And we're going to get you for a sleep study. He said, Mr. Hayram, I'm here to tell you, you got six months to live. Your smoking, your tobacco habits, you ruined your lungs. 1990s. My drinking and my smoking was carried over from my parents. Yeah, I had the free will, but they taught me. I am 50, I'm going to be 53 years old. By the grace of God, God gave me more years. I'm struggling today. I just spent the last three weeks with pneumonia. I just spent April 1st in the hospital with pneumonia with complications from emphysema. I quit the late 1990s smoking. I quit it. God gave me the victory. Over quitting smoking. 
three weeks ago and then a, a week ago. I almost had my last breath. And you asked my daughter. Hey, my father set the example. Drink it up. My father set the sample. Smoke it up. I thank God the womanizing that my father taught me was, was only in my head, never physical. I thank God I never womanize against my wife, Lisa, or my wife, Tracy. That the only things I would have had would have been just thoughts in Matthew chapter 5. It, it, they've been confessed. Never physical application. Thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord I got victory over alcohol. But I was taught in alcohol. I was trained in alcohol. I, and listen, I remember in the 70s, I remember growing up, we're sitting by a campfire, and Dad would hand little boy, here, have a drink of beer. Isn't it cute? Isn't it cute? Little style, he's drinking beer. Isn't it cute? No, it's not cute. It's not cute to give that little child a, a little sip of beer. It's not cute. Here, hold my cigarette for me. Candy cigarettes. We used to have candy cigarettes. What a stupid, what a stupid, what a stupid candy, candy cigarettes. Because I went to the real cigarettes. I went to pipe smoking. At least I enjoyed the pipe smoking because I got different flavors and all that. I smoked cigars. There were topless restaurants before I, before I was, hey, my dad went to them. Why not should I? My dad taught me well. Somehow Abraham and Sarah taught their little boy. Honey, lie for me. And I know people in my family, they're dead now, but I see people in my own family. I see the, the sins of the parents. Upon the sins of the children. I've seen it. I even lived it. Living it with my own children. Lived it as a child myself. How Satan has entered into the family. Oh, uh, just have a little, you know, just sit down with a little beer. Sit down with an ashtray and a cigarette. You know, there's nothing wrong. Sit down at the table and play canasta. And then watch that little child grow up. I want to tell you, parents and parents to be, you're a teacher, you're a teacher, you're a teacher of that child. And the sins that you teach that child, that you are not literally, you're not, you're not physically, most Christian parents, well, you know, they're not forcing the sins upon their child, but you're teaching your child, you're inhabiting your child, you're, you're inheriting your child into sin. I got one more story and I'm done. And if, if I did any ill to my parents, I'm sorry, I honor my mother. I love my dad. And I, I was sorry about him. But I could never forgive my dad. He never asked for forgiveness. He had never gotten things, as far as I know, right with Jesus Christ. And I, I got a story in him. I remember there was a time where my dad lived. I wasn't saved yet. I remember I came, my dad was working in the garage. He was working working on a car or something like that. And I had a bag in my hand. And I pulled out a Budweiser, a beer. I handed it to my dad. When I got mine, we opened up. We're standing there. We're talking. He's got tools in there. And he said, man, this is great. Because I'm having a beer with my son. And he was proud. He pulled out one of his tipperwells, and I pulled out one of my one of my cigarettes, and here we are. Bang! I braised my son. Now look at the moment we are having a beer and a, and a tobacco. 
in a garage that used to be a greenhouse in Whiteman Street, New London, Connecticut. Achievement in sin. Ruined lives. Poor memories of a, of a wife and mother that's saved today, that loves the Lord, serving the Lord. She's got great medical difficulty with MS, and, and, and she, she's just incapable physically and mentally. And when I'm in the hospital uh, on a Sunday, I want to call my mom and say, Mom, I feel sick. I, I call up, I find out she's in church. Amen. Glory to God. That churned my heart. My mom is ill. She's sick. She's frail. She's saved. And she's in church. Amen. Glory to God. On April 25th, I met Jesus Christ. I got saved. I knelt down 773 Broad Street in Waterford, Connecticut, in my grandmother's living room at her coffee table. I asked Jesus Christ to save my soul. He saved my soul at Calvary with Joe Whitmore and Joe Caswell in a King James Bible. My grandmother and my brother, maybe my grandpa was there. I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. I was born again. That's my new birth. Forget about my old birth. That's my new birth. April 25th, 1987. April 26th, 1987, I went to church Sunday morning. I stood up. I said, I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. Church service ended. I went back to 9 Whiteman Street, New London, Connecticut. I went back to that same garage. My dad was outside. The same place. I said, Dad, I ain't got a beer for you. Let's smoke our tobacco. Same place, outside though. I said, Dad, I don't remember the quick word. This is the second day. This is the next day of my salvation. Don't you tell me. Don't you get mad at how I preach. I've been on fire ever since. I said, Dad, April 26, 1987. Nine Whiteman Street, the same place I brought the beer, the same place I brought the tobacco. I said, Dad, I got to tell you something. He goes, what's that? I said, Dad, you're going to hell. My dad told me, don't you tell me to go to hell. I said, no, 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 Dad. I said, Dad, I didn't tell you to go to hell. I said, you're going to hell. And I don't remember the exact words, but I said, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ get saved. And don't you tell me I didn't try with my dad. Don't you tell me I have hatred against my dad. And since April 26, 1987, my wife Lisa, my wife Tracy, my daughter, my son, and I. Years after years after years after years after years, we tried witnessing to that guy. We tried telling him about Jesus Christ, and he rejected, and he rejected, and he rejected. And before I moved down to Florida, Tracy and I went to go see my dad. We, we visited him, and he had his little sitting room on his porch in, in his house, 9 Whiteman Street. He sat out there. He had a little squirrel feeder. He had a bird feeder. He had a TV, and he, he this, this was a sitting room, and he watched traffic and people go by. And he had shelves. And on that shelf, he had a picture of his granddaughter. He had a picture of his grandson holding a sign saying, don't go to hell, only Jesus saves. You know, it's easier for a parent to teach a child to sin. And it's much harder for that child to teach their, their children, their parents, excuse me, about Jesus. Now, thank God my mom got saved. But I'm talking about myself. I am talking about my parents. I'm talking about my uncles. I'm talking about my aunts. I'm talking about my cousins. I'm talking about friends. I'm talking about coworkers. I'm talking about neighbors. I'm talking about people I just see passing by. I'm talking about the very thing we see in the Bible today. Isaac wasn't even around. And he sinned the sin of his parents. Honey, 
when we get into town, will you lie for me? And you know, when you read Genesis 12, Genesis 20, and Genesis 26, it is the same fruit in the basket. The stories don't change that much. Only the names have been changed to protect it. And God is not going to slam down his arm to prevent what you taught your children. What I'm trying to say is, well, you know, I'm going to do it, but God will protect my children. Really? How come the sin of Abram, the sin of Abraham, was passed upon the sin of Isaac? And if, you, if your children are grown up today, look at, are they doing something in their life that's wrong, and you taught them. Now you may not set them down. To, okay, now do this, Junior. Come on, do this, Junior. No, no, no. They've been watching you. They've been eyeing you. They've been seeing you, and you've been teaching them. Whether they are in the room or they're not in the room, you've been teaching them. You will be teaching them. And the very fact is that they will prone to sin more than righteousness because they are of the, the nature of Adam and not evolution. It don't get better. And don't think you're going to hide those secret sins. Because I know there are secret sins of my parents I found out. I know there were secret sins of Stiley that my, I, I didn't know my mom ever knew, but she knew. And there are secret sins. You don't think your, your spouse knows. Oh, they know. And if your spouse knows, and if your parents know, so do your children. Now, let me show you one more verse. Very familiar verse I use all the time. First John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, God will forgive us our sins. Amen. Glory to God. God forgave me my alcohol. God forgave me my tobacco. God gave me the great victory. Also, a Bible verse is. Be not deceived, God's not mocked. What sort of man so is that shall also what about your children? Now you may have been forgiven by God, and you will be forgiven by, and it will be cleansed by God. What about your children? What'd you do to your children? What'd you teach your children? You better think twice before you light up. Most stupidest thing ever to be on an alcohol package. Drink responsibility. Just don't drink at all. When I was in the hospital, I, I watched the TV. Florida has this thing, you know, you can quit smoking. You can quit smoking. Why don't you just stop smell, selling the crap? You want, you want to end alcoholism? You want to end tobaccoism? Just don't sell the crap. Nothing funnier when I come from Connecticut. Nothing funnier, I don't know about us, but Connecticut. They have, you know, anti gambling things, you know, for people to quit gambling, though they have casinos now. But nothing funnier to, you know, quit gambling and then half the money of the of the lottery, the state lottery, goes into the education. What? Cuckoo. Now, I may have brought up some things about my family and all that. I, I, I apologize and I'm wrong, but my, my lesson, my, my thing is, you know what? Little boy Stiley grew up watching. Little boy Stiley was taught by his parents. I mean, mama told me don't steal. Mama told me don't lie. Mom, but, you know, 
I see many times mama and dad call up the boss and say, I'm sick, and they weren't sick. Don't lie. I'm not feeling well. Okay, everybody get in the car. We're going somewhere. You're setting an example. You tell your children don't lie, and then you call out sick and you're not sick. Or you say, oh, auntie such and such, it's so happy to see you. And, you know, you've been saying all day long before they showed up and how terrible they are. Your children are watching. Your children are listening. Your children, your children are observing you. And I'm a parent. I'm a child of parents. Well, send them to school to a teacher. No, parent, you're a teacher. You are a teacher of code of character and ethics in that child that you brought into this world. And I'm here to tell you, I am sure, I, I am a doctor of theology. You can look at my diploma. I am certified Dr. Stiley William Hayward. But I don't need that doctor to tell you of a surety, 100%. 100, this is 100%. You're going to teach that child something wrong. And you may not even meant to teach him that wrong. That's one of the harshest lessons I've learned of being a father. When I see one of my children, it's like, oh, man, that's me. That's me. When I, when I, I look at one of my children, I say, something bad, I say, oh, man. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. That's the bad stuff. The damage I've done. Oh, I can repent. Lord God, Father, forgive me. I've forgiven you. Reaping and sowing. Reaping and sowing. You know, what we do, and this may be a little, I, don't, I can't see the guy, but this may be a little, I'm sorry if it's a little long. I got emphysema. 53 years old, and I'm suffering from emphysema. You, you can talk to my daughter, lung doctor, we talked to him. I'm I am now frail. I am now under the suffrage of smoking tobacco and being associated with tobacco growing up. Listen, whatever year fresh freshman year was, I don't remember. I was subject to tobacco secondhand smoke as a child. Then I grew up foolishly and smoked two or three packs of cigarettes a day until I quit. But there's nothing worse for a doctor to say you got emphysema. Okay, that, that's. But I'll tell you what the worst thing is being a. Uh, listen, a father. I'm a father. I'm a father with emphysema. Because when you see your child and they got the same sin you got, I'll name the sin. Aggravation. I'm not going to tell you who or what. But I, I see, I, I, get, I, I get aggravated and I see it. I see it in my children. That's worse than emphysema. Because that aggravation, maybe if I get grandchildren, maybe. We're teaching our children. And we don't even realize what we're teaching our children, maybe. Sometimes make it too late. Sometimes they don't even know. You know, they're, they're famous to grow up, you know, they smoke and drink and, <laughs> and everything. And they don't realize, you know, they, what they did to their children and grandchildren. 
You know, Adam and Eve, did you think they really realized what they had done when they ate that fruit? You think they really realized that there would be a hospital behind me? There would be people dying? I, I hear ambulances. I hear police cars, prison. You think Adam and Eve really knew what they did to the sins of their children? That the Bible records Eve when she had Seth. Is it Seth? God has given me a man. And I'm not quoting the God is giving men for whom Cain killed. There was a day that Eve got notice that her son was murdered. The sins of the parents. And if you're an adult and you're a parent, and your children have grown and maybe have grandchildren, you're agreeing with me 100%. You're saying, Stiley, and as many things you say, I don't, I don't believe, I don't like, you kick me. I, I, I've got to agree with you 100%. My children are doing something that I don't want them to do, and I taught them. I didn't want to teach them that, but they... It's, and if you don't agree with me, you're a fool. Unfriend me and don't have anything to associate with me. You want to be a fool, go in a fool wagon. But right now, my lesson is to you is, even before you become a parent, or even you're not a parent, you need to be observant of your life because your children are observant of you. And we see it in Genesis 22. 6, Genesis 12, and Genesis 20. 